Welcome to A2 Council Update, a recap of the Ann Arbor City Council meeting on September 5th, 2023. This meeting included discussion of amending the Transit Corridor Zoning District, an ordinance requiring home energy audits, rezoning at Henry and State that will allow more short-term rentals, and eliminating council responsibility for traffic calming decisions. This is the voting chart for the council meeting on August 7th, 2023. There was one non-unanimous vote on the amendment to Transit Corridor District Zoning. All other agenda items were approved unanimously. Council member Chris Watson was absent. This was his third absence since taking office nine months ago. You can find this voting chart and more information about this meeting at a2council.com. Like and subscribe if you would like to see more content like this. The meeting included a monthly report from Stephanie Carter, chair of the Independent Community Police Oversight Commission, or ICPOC. She spoke about nominations to the board and an upcoming public forum. I have uh, spoken before and I'm going to speak again about our public forum that is coming up. It's going to be Wednesday, September 27th. As I've said before, we are your only commission with the word community in our title. And so we do intend to try and involve the community. I hope to see some of you on the 27th. We're going to be at um, the Peace Neighborhood Center. After introductory remarks, public comments, and staff explanations, council discussed agenda items for a little over an hour. Seven people signed up in advance to offer public comment. Six people spoke to issues on the agenda. The consent agenda included 11 items and nearly $8 million in expenditures. Nothing was pulled for discussion. All items on the consent agenda were approved unanimously. Council considered an amendment to transit corridor district zoning that will permit auto-related businesses as a special exception use. Council discussed the amendment for about 10 minutes. And so I think that we have to uh, recognize that people will be hopefully having one car per household, maybe giving up cars and having car shares, but I don't think that we can legislate cars out of existence next year. I won't be supporting this. You know, I think our primary aim in these corridors is increasing mixed uses, encouraging high density, encouraging alternative transportation like bus, white walking, biking, etc., and discouraging auto-dependent and auto-oriented uses. The car sales is just a no-go for me. Council approved the amendment to transit corridor district zoning with three votes of dissent. Council then considered an ordinance that will require the disclosure of home energy audits to a buyer as part of the process of selling a home. The ordinance does not apply to multi-story multifamily housing, accessory dwelling units, mobile homes, or commercial buildings. Earlier in the evening, residents spoke to the issue in a public hearing. So we're sitting here today saying that we're going to force sellers to do something they don't need and will never use by doing the audit. This is a big expense. Let's find someone that will actually use these reports. And I don't see any downsides to this. The buyers and the sellers aren't required to make any upgrades. Having the information out there gives us some better metrics on how we're doing energy-wise as a city. I would much rather see this amount of money from our climate action millage be spent in achieving reductions in carbon rather than producing reports that may not be adding any value. Council discussed the ordinance for about 10 minutes. The data we will gather through the home energy scores will help us determine which households have greater need and can benefit the most from city-sponsored grants to make energy improvements. You know, I agree that we need to do everything that we possibly can in our fight against climate change. I was reflecting on the comment that these reports would not be used or what is the use of them um, if it's not if it's not useful in, in the process of selling or, or buying. Um, and I was thinking about how home buyers in the city um, have begun to ask if their home has racial covenants. Council approved the ordinance unanimously. After a brief introduction, council unanimously approved amendments to marijuana regulations that create a new class of microbusiness and extend allowable business hours to midnight. Council then considered a rezoning and site plan for the block bounded by White Street, Henry Street, State Street, and Stimson Street. A proposed development called Southtown will have 216 dwelling units. This block is currently zoned multifamily residential and would be rezoned to Campus Business District, or C1AR. The C1AR zoning district has no height limit and allows dedicated full-time short-term rentals, or Airbnb, as a primary use. 
the developer has promised that no more than 30% of units will be full-time short-term rentals. As part of the conditional zoning, the developer has volunteered three other conditions. Height is limited to 100 feet, only 54 parking spots will be constructed, and it will be all electric except for natural gas emergency backup. In a public hearing earlier in the evening, the developers spoke about other Airbnb properties they manage in the neighborhood and defended the current project. Sometimes these occupants stay for weeks, and many times they stay for months. At the end of the day, we realized because of consumer habits that the best method to attract occupants was through the Airbnb booking platform. I would ask council members not to get caught up in hot button terminology, for example, Airbnb, <laughs> used by people who are trying to run council from the outside. The project incorporates renewable on-site energy generation as well as a microgrid designed to coordinate all of these components into a holistic, sustainable energy system. The bedrock of the sustainable energy system is Southtown's microgrid control system, which will manage and reduce campus load and optimize the integration, the integration of the sustainable energy resources to targeted objectives. Neighborhood residents and others offered comments. Next to me is a building that used to be uh, apartment buildings. Uh, there were eight apartments there. They are now all um, short-term rentals. And we can um, surmise then that short-term rentals bring in a lot more money than regular rentals. But it's my position that they take away from housing that is apparently very much needed in Ann Arbor. I say to you, I mean, all of you ran on more affordable housing, and you're, you're doing things that are, are counterproductive to more affordable housing in Ann Arbor. Anyway, it's pretty frustrating for us. I am very concerned about a rezoning of, uh, of, of a residential area below us to uh, something called the campus business uh, zoning, if I understand that. I just think that Lower Burns Park, I think of as residential, and I worry that by allowing campus business to, to expand, to start at that bottom edge, it will just tip over everything to become campus business district um, all the way south of us. The energy advantages countered by the developer could be accomplished under the current zoning. One of the reasons the developer is seeking rezoning is so that they can put short-term rentals on the site. I'm sorry if the developers object to us talking about those things, but it's true. You know, even if some of those uh, were left totally empty with a middle finger sign on the window, that would still be more housing than is there right now. So I would ask City Council, instead of protecting the interests of those who would bring us more short-term rentals, why not protect the interests of prospective long-term renters who would like to make Ann Arbor their full-time home? I think this whole short-term rental versus long-term rental thing is a false dichotomy. We have demand for both in our community. I think that people visiting our city should have the opportunity to properly experience our walkable community and you know something that we're proud of. Well, if the nature of conditional zoning is if you approve it for one person down at South Town, it has to be voluntary. So the next person wants to see when they are, and they don't have to ask for the limits at 30%. Uh, they can stand mute on any limits of height or any limits on the number of short-term rental units. And you have to, it has to be voluntary. You can't make them add those on. I love everything about this project. The zoning is more than appropriate for this building. I think it's an excellent project and I hope you'll approve it. This is the, the sort of place where we should be having more density than that, more height than that, et, et, et cetera. And Frankly, it seems, it seems like we don't have that just because of these zoning limitations. Council discussed the rezoning and site plan for about 15 minutes. I guess I'll just speak for myself, running on affordable housing. And, you know, I ran on a pl platform of providing more housing of all types. So I began this meeting reflecting on refugee families coming to Ann Arbor, much like how my own parents were welcomed in the 70s. So we know Southtown might not meet uh, refugees' immediate needs either, unless, say, they employ refugees and other low-income residents. So what's the connection? The connection is that we cannot truly be a welcoming community without addressing housing supply, all types of housing. Uh, for my part, too, I'm, uh, I'm excited about the prospect of this rezoning. I think it, uh, it hits uh, so many of the notes that we're trying to accomplish with the community. It uh, enables uh, us to build uh, a 
it enables uh, property owners uh, to build uh, multifamily housing to expand the housing uh, housing choice within our, our community. Council unanimously approved both the rezoning and the site plan for Southtown. Council considered a change in policy for traffic calming projects. Decisions to move forward with traffic calming projects will be delegated to the city administrator and no longer require a council vote. Earlier in the meeting, public commenters spoke to the issue. I'd like to see something coming forward in the future that um, calms traffic by default on major roads. I think it's absolutely critical that we look at the unintended consequences. If we are putting traffic calming on one street, we need to look at the parallel streets. The resolution includes a resolved clause directing the use of a collaborative model for public engagement. The significance of this was not explained during council discussion. However, it was discussed in detail at the Transportation Commission in August. Transportation Commission recommends that City Council direct staff to amend the Neighborhood Traffic Calming Program to a collaborative model of public engagement instead of the current empowerment model. And this is unchanged, but as a reminder, this refers to the spectrum of public engagement that I believe that we shared with you last time. We're on the very far end empowerment model is basically what's enabling um, what is giving this requirement of 51%, I believe, must say yes in order for it to happen. Empowerment, or sorry, the um, collaborative model is still engages with the neighborhood, uh, solicits feedback on what is needed and what is wanted, much like you saw on the South 7th project or the Greenview project, but does not um, allow projects to be vetoed because they don't meet a majority. Moving forward, traffic calming strategies may be implemented on streets even when over 50% of residents on those streets oppose them. Another clause in the resolution explains that the Transportation Commission will work with staff to define updates to the programs. Councilmember Briggs confirmed the plan for policy change to happen without a vote of elected representatives. What we don't need to be doing is having staff have to come to us every time there's a tweak in the program that they want to make. Council expressed support for delegating traffic calming decisions to staff and mayoral appointees on the Transportation Commission. Nine months ago, residents in Ward 4 had specific concerns about mayoral appointees on the Transportation Commission. Last November, City Council considered a recommendation from the Transportation Commission for installation of a buffered bike lane on a neighborhood side street two blocks from a dead end. A local resident explained at the time, the solution was proposed by a group of committed citizen volunteers on an oversight committee, but it was against the recommendation from city engineering staff and against the published transportation plan that was created by transportation experts. It's also against significant resident preference for a biking solution that accommodates current uses on the street, including parking. I also want to say that it's really concerning as a citizen that we're all here tonight discussing such a reckless and uninformed motion. This group that is an oversight committee are directing street designs and impacting the safety of our roadways. And with seconds. all due respect, these people are not qualified to overrule city engineers or transportation experts guidance. This week, city council voted unanimously to delegate traffic calming decisions to mayoral appointees on the Transportation Commission and eliminate the requirement for local neighborhood support of traffic calming projects. After a brief introduction, Council unanimously approved a resolution asking the City Administrator to analyze and improve City processes for data transparency and performance assessment. Council then considered a resolution directing the City Administrator to pursue a historical marker and statue at City Hall honoring former City Council member Kathy Kozachenko, who was the first openly gay person to win elected office in the United States. She served on Ann Arbor City Council from 1974 to 1976. She was a member of the Human Rights Party, which promoted the idea of putting people before profits. Council made statements in support for about five minutes. Kathy Kozachenko is a trailblazer in queer history, and more broadly, the history of our city and our nation. The resolution to pursue a historical marker and statue was approved unanimously. Council then considered a resolution asking the state legislature to eliminate a program that allows employers to pay sub-minimum wages to people with disabilities. Earlier in the evening, a public commenter expressed support. That it is still legal for some people to be paid less than one dollar an hour in Michigan thanks to this policy. Council discussed it for about three minutes. Currently in Ann Arbor, there are no registered 14C certificate holders, which is great. And this resolu resolution is our statement that we strongly discourage employers from seeking these waivers. The resolution was approved unanimously. 
Finally, council considered the purchase of property on Miller Road for $2.8 million to create a new election center and facilities for the local cable channel, CTN. Staff explained the need for an election center. There's a need for an immense amount of physical space uh, to properly administer an election in the state of Michigan now. Some of the money for this purchase comes directly from funds previously allocated to affordable housing. For more on that, see the link in the description of this video. Council unanimously approved the purchase of property on Miller Road for the new election center and CTN studios. The meeting adjourned before 10.30 p.m. without any additional public comment. For more details about this meeting, visit a2council.com. Welcome to this week's A2 Council Moment of Zen. Now I am going to do some math, and this is a little dangerous, but if the development maxes out the 30% ST, STRs, that will be 64 to 65 out of 218 units. 218 minus 65 gives us total residential 153. I don't have total confidence in that number, but I think it's pretty close. Hooray!